Hello, and welcome to you all. Thank you for joining the Center for Applied Linguistics today for this 30-minute webinar called Equity in Practice, Multilingual Learners with Disability. Uh, this webinar is part of Cal's Critical Conversations Research to Policy and Practice webinar series. This year, Cal is hosting a bunch of live virtual discussions with educators, policymakers, and administrators like yourself to explore what it means to take an asset-based approach when working with multilingual learners and how an equ equity perspective can and must guide state, local, and national policy across uh, different educational settings. Before we begin with this 30 minute webinar, I do have a few housekeeping notes to go over. This webinar is being recorded and it will be posted to cal.org immediately after our event concludes. I will remind you that the views, thoughts, and opinions expressed during today's webinar uh, belong solely to the persons expressing them and do not necessarily represent the views of the Center for Applied Linguistics. Now the fun part, we encourage you, the audience, to ask us as many questions as you would like. You can do that in the Q&A box that's at the bottom of your Zoom screen. We will try to address as many questions as possible at the end of our discussion today. You can also click on the chat button at the bottom of your screen to share your thoughts and comments with your colleagues. Uh, go ahead and give it a try now and tell us where you're calling in from. Um, we're always really curious about where everybody uh, finds us from. Uh, note, though, that we don't usually check the questions in the chat box, so keep your questions for your presenters in the Q&A box below. Now, I'd like to introduce our moderator for today's webinar, uh, Mary Bell Marrero Colon. Uh, Mary Bell works at the Center for Applied Linguistics as the Associate Director for Professional Development. In her 35 years as an educator, uh, inclusion specialist, program coordinator, administrator, and professional developer, Mary Bell has acquired experience within the fields of ESL, bilingual education, and uh, bilingual special education, special education instruction and evaluation, and of course, professional development. Uh, she has, uh, she's, a, she's been an adjunct at various colleges and universities and teacher programs. And these include the Central, uh, sorry, Central Connecticut State University, uh, College of New Rochelle, College of Mount St. Vincent, and the University of Maryland Baltimore campus. Uh, that is my spiel and intro, Mary Bell. Thank you so much for hosting us again today on this really interesting topic and I'll turn it over to you. Hi, Trey, and welcome everyone. Uh, Trey, you may want to check the chat box. People are having trouble getting in. It says the chat is disabled. So while he's working on our tech, and I got to tell you, Trey's really great on tech, I'd like to introduce you to our speakers today. And, you know, our big MC who's going to be asking questions uh, is Dr. Alfredo Artiles. He is the Lee L. Jacks Professor of Education at Stanford University. Dr. Atiles is the Director of the Research Institute at Stanford Center for Comparative Studies in Race and Ethnicity and the Stanford Center for Opportunity Policy and Education. Dr. Artiles' scholarship brings attention to all the intersections that we're talking about today, as well as many others of historical, spatial, cultural influences in the production of racial and linguistic disparities in special education across school districts, across cities, across states, and across nations. So we are really happy to have Dr. Artiles with us. Uh, and our guest speaker today is Dr. Maria, I can't pronounce the last name really well, Kyoi? Choye. Choye. Peña, and she earned her PhD in urban education at the Graduate Center City University of New York, where she was also an advanced research collaborative fellow and a presidential magnet fellow. She's bilingual, biliterate education research and educator who examines the intersections of disability, language, school parent partnerships, which is a really important piece of what we're talking about today and what we are facing every day in our schools and education policy. So I am going to be monitoring your questions and we are going to be really listening and learning from our speakers today. Alfredo, can you take it over? Gracias Maribel. Thank you uh, colleague for joining us. It's exciting to see uh, the representation that we have today. 
Um, I'm delighted to be here with uh, my colleague, Maria Choi Pena, and uh, we look forward to having a good conversation today about multilingual learners with disabilities. Let me get started with the first question, Maria, and um, <laughs> then we'll hear from you. Uh, we'll cover three questions in all, and we look forward to having the conversation with our um, attendees. First question then. A medical perspective is privileged in the education field to define disability and design programs and interventions. We have known that for a long time. This means that individual factors are emphasized with less attention to contextual and cultural considerations. Tell us how you define disability in your research, particularly with Latinx families, and why is this perspective important when working with this community? Um, great, thank you so much. First, uh, I just wanna say thank you to Cal for having me here today um, to talk about this really important student population um, who I've had the privilege of also working with as a former bilingual special education teacher. Um, so having said that, I think it's really important to understand that the ways that I view disability are informed by my research participants' experiences. Um, and as such, it's worthy of note to know that I approach this my work from a social model of disability, which counters the medical model by asserting that there's nothing wrong right, with a person who moves or thinks differently. There's nothing inherently broken with an individual. Rather, the disability manifests from society's deference, right, to disabled bodies and from society's failure to function in a way that affirms diverse ways of being. So while an imp impairment may exist, right, the disability is a result of one's interactions with different structures and systems, which means that interpretations of disability are also contextual. And this is how participants in my work have talked about disabilities. So first, um, mothers' understandings of disability primarily stem from their experiences with their children at home and outside of any academic context, right? So within their children, disability is understood as a small problem um, for those who have high incidence disability classifications and as a natural variation, right? So a natural part of human variety for those with low incidence disability, uh, disability di diagnosis. So we're thinking here autism um, as opposed to uh, speech and language, speech or language impairment. The next thing that we see, right, is that they don't necessarily view disability as a deficit, nor do they view it as a negative, as anything negative or bad about their children. So within academic settings, mothers understand disabilities as something that only impacts them in school, since that is overwhelmingly with the majority of disabilities for dually classified English learners or multilingual learners are diagnosed. And then finally, um, what we start to notice is that they don't necessarily, what I've started to notice is that they don't necessarily view disability as a deficit um, until we start seeing classification labels being put into place. So they understand the classification labels to be something stigmatizing and problematic, right? So they keep disability classification labels and diagnoses within schools very secretive and hidden from family members and friends, right? But they accept the diagnosis and classifications at school in a desire to get support, right? So that, so that they believe that with enough support and help, they'll be able to to facilitate their child's release, right? Or shedding of that disability label. Um, because really they want their child to be seen as an individual and as a person, right? They don't want them positioned within the context of all of these stigmatizations and categorizations. So it's a really complicated way of understanding disability, but it really taps back to this idea that disability is socially constructed because how we perceive and experience disability and how we address it um, really varies by space and institution. Thank you, Maria. Those are indeed rich findings and insights that uh, you're uh, sharing with us. Uh, I find them valuable because it brings attention to the cultural dimension of disability and how families and individuals make sense and interpret what it means to have a disability. So I'm sure we'll get uh, quite a few comments and questions about this because as we know, it's not necessarily what we tend to see in school systems. Um, I'm gonna move on to the next question. Uh, and the question is that there are multiple misunderstandings about Latinx multilingual students with disabilities. 
and how families participate in the education of their children and youth. For example, we've seen research showing that parents are advised to stop using their first language at home to avoid confusing their children, even though there is no basis for that. Further, there's th these families are frequently representing, represented as not valuing education, which explains in their minds the lack of involvement in their children's education. What have you found in your work regarding parental engagement for dually classified learners? Um, I think, you know, in response to this question, the first thing that's really important to keep in mind is that families choosing to remove their children from multilingual programs is a form of parental engagement, right? It's a form of parental engagement where the parent is taking on the role of is taking a role in instructional decision making for their children right however how vocal they are is heavily influenced by their sense of belonging among other experts or professionals in the school community right and that's another thing that we have to keep in mind when we're thinking about how we're understanding parental engagement right so first we start to see a huge amount of personal engagement right on the way of, of mothers by spending time with their children which is to say that this very tax commodity for a lot of these families is being gathered as a way for mothers to maintain connections with their children and to maintain a presence in their academic lives right so this means walking their children to school this means spending money right on a train or on bus uh, fare in order to be able to take their children to and from school, right? This is a safety precaution, but it's also an opportunity for parent, for mothers to stay connected with their child's education in a very physical and kind of tangible way for their kids. We see mothers investing time in teaching their children life skills. Um, particularly interesting for me is this factor that even though they were opting to put their children in English monolingual settings at school, they were then taking on the role of language educator within the home. Right. And so teaching the children Spanish at home, um, producing Spanish media for the family to consume together. The third thing that we see is mothers finding extracurricular activities and supporting that, right? Cultural activities, social activities for their children. Um, mothers taking children to classes at museums, um, signing them up for uh, sports um, things so that children could also get that social connection with their typically developing peers that they may not have been experiencing in self-contained or isolated classroom settings at school. So this is a really important way to think about how like parental engagement happens on a personal level, right? The next thing that we see, oops, sorry. I don't know what happened. So what do you guys see? Here we go. The next thing that we see is parents using interlocutors or intermediaries like technology to translate work, homework back and forth. A lot of parents were using Google Translate to translate communications um, to help their kids complete homework. They were using YouTube to self-learn skills that their children needed support with. When they couldn't use technology to facilitate those processes, they would then bring in relatives, right, who were English using. So we look at um, things like eldest children, right, or relatives who could translate important documents like individual education plans and report cards, which is a really I think it's important to mention that this is an added stress that is being placed on families because IEP documentation, according to IDEA, should be legally translated, right? But it isn't often translated. My experience has been in the state where I've been working with and doing a lot of my research. It usually doesn't happen unless there's a legal court battle, right? So that is, so we're putting on a pressure for parents and then faulting them for not being present physically at schools without acknowledging the ways that we're asking them to take on responsibilities that are not theirs, right? Finally, the third way that we see it is that among this community, which is which typically tends to be also represented low socioeconomically, you see parents engaging tutors, um, hiring tutors to come into the home and support their learner, um, particularly around homework. This is a very common um, practice that I saw within my participants in the communities that I've worked with. And finally, they view the child's educational, um, individual education plan team members as an extension of them, right? Um, 
they view this as a support system that exists within the school serving as an extension of them and part of the child's parenting community right teachers ip team members service providers they were the ones who had the most access to the child as a learner so they were the ones who were best suited to influence what the learner's experiences should be right so even removing themselves actively from uh, parental engagement opportunities right was an active and conscious choice right was done with the perceptions and belief that that would function in the best interest of the child so i think what we're really seeing coming up from my work and the work of others is that these families are not being represented appropriately because the context with which we're understanding their engagement is not culturally appropriate or culturally sensitive excellent and uh this is it's amazing how much we can learn when we bring an asset perspective that many people in this event have been using for a long time. So I appreciate the attention to um, the uh, ingenuity and the commitment that you have found in those families and um, communities, uh, Maria. Let's Thank close you. with the last question. This is uh, an event that is concerned with issues of policy. So let me ask you, what are the policy implications that stem from this work? Yeah, so I have many. Um, and while the previous slides were really focused on kind of supporting imagery, this one is really text dense because I want you to be able to take a screenshot or grab this and be able to use it uh, moving forward. Um, so I thought about, about policies implications at three levels. So first at the federal level, the state level, and the local level. And across the board, the biggest thing that we're noticing is that we need to develop intersectional policies and practices. Um, and so what that means is we've been talking about intersectionality as as identity markers, right? But what we should be thinking about is intersectionality within its original context and definition, which is the ways that systems, right, function and impact individuals, right? So a dually classified student who is being supported by two distinct and separate policies is not actually having their needs met, right? Because one policy is not considering the other, which is what we see happening often with IDEA and English learner policies. So at the federal level, we need services that match classifications. Um, we often talk about special education being a service, not a place, right? We also need to think about language services in this way, right? English language supports should be thought of as a service, not a place, right? So that they shouldn't restrict the, uh, the spaces that students have access to. Um, we need to amend IDEA first to fully attend to students' linguistic needs. We need to enforce translation of documents. Uh, we need to monitor minoritized parent participation in IEP development. And we also need to analyze IDEA for anti-racist and anti-ableist context, right? Because a lot of what we know now um, is embedded in these institutions, right? And in, unless we use these anti-racist and anti-ableist lenses, we're not gonna really be able to uncover uh, what harm can be perpetrated, right? Even by well-intended people within policies that exist or practices that are rooted in oppression. Um, finally, we desperately need to increase funding for inclusive or co-teaching placements um, so that students can have greater access to both their linguistic peers, but also their typically developing peers. Um, often, dually classified students are made to choose one or the other. Um, and finally, we need L policies that expand beyond English as a new language or English as a second language uh, classes and placement. Uh, at the state level, I believe that programs must match state demographics. So we need to have data collection on dually identified students and their eventual placements. I think we need longitudinal data on where these students move and across which spaces. Um, we need to incentivize and require uh, or require dual certifications or endorsements for teachers so that we can address teacher shortages, particularly in the areas of language um, and special education. We need programming options that center multilingualism rather than English monolingualism for students with disabilities. You know, one place where we often don't think about segregation is the fact that we have access, typically developing children, right, or neurotypical children 
have access to dual language programs, right? But students with disabilities don't, even regardless of their linguistic background, even though we know that students with disabilities are capable of multilingualism and benefit from multilingualism, just like every other population. Um, and finally, we need to train all teachers on IDEA's child find. Um, this is particularly important because we've seen this trend where language educators will try to hold off for a set amount of time when they encounter newcomers or emergent multilinguals, where they say, well, let's give them more time for linguistic development. But that actually is counter to students' legal rights, which mean that they can get services and evaluations as soon as a problem is identified, right? We need to stop thinking of special education as a bad place, and we need to find ways to make special education a better and more supportive space for all of our learners. Finally, at the local level, um, I'm sorry, I know I'm going really fast, but it's a little bit of time. At the local level, I really think that schools must reflect community interests and values. Uh, one of the things that is listed here at the end, but I want to mention first is establishing schools as safe zones for marginalized parents. One of the things that came up often in my research, in my research and in my data collection, were mothers sharing how they didn't feel safe at the school or they were afraid of being at the schools, even within schools that were populated by other Latinos, right? But there are generational differences between first gen and immigrant populations, between second generation, and the ways that they encountered those schools, right? And the ways that those families may encounter police or immigration systems, right? So there are those differences that we need to be thinking about. Beyond this, we need curricular materials that reflect the local communities. That means across language and abilities. We often see diversity of race within a lot of spaces, but we ne don't necessarily see diversity of ability, nor do we see linguistic diversity. Um, finally, uh, next, we need to review policies, uh, school policies, particularly school language policies with an intersectional lens, um, understanding what is lost if we place a child in a monolingual setting versus what is gained if we place them in a dual language setting and what do, supports do they need. And we need to provide professional development around anti-ableism and anti-racism focused within marginalized communities, right? We need to be talking about the ways that racism and ableism is systemic, right? And even people of color can perpetuate those systems and particularly within schools as school agents. Secondly, we need to think about uh, give PD on instructional practices that support multilingual and academic development. I've um, developed a framework called Trudy L, which is a bridging of translanguaging and universal design for learning that allows the students' home languages to be integrated into the UDL science framework. And, um, and that's it. Yes, I got it all. All right. Thank you, Maria. That's a lot of information. We have a lot of activity in the chat. Maribel is going to help us oh, go through that. Yes. We've got a you. lot of questions. <clears throat> we have a lot of questions. And thank you to everybody who's been providing uh, resources for your colleagues. I think that's great that that's on there and that we can share them. I've been actually opening them up and keeping them open so that I can look at them afterwards. So one of the questions that came up, Maria, is when you were talking about translation and IEPs, how legally we need to provide parents with translations. Now, one of your uh, colleagues out there totally agrees with you, totally agrees with the law that we have to provide these translations. But the question is who in the school is responsible for making sure that all of the materials are translated? I know some states actually have IEPs that mm -hmm. are developed in the native in the home language of the youngster but what do we do in the ones that where they're not so i think this is one of the areas this is why it's really important that we focus this at the federal level as like a higher level policy right because we need funding for a few things we need funding for the actual translation we cannot continue to put the work of translating on multilingual people who are employed within the school rather than people who are actually trained to be translators, right? Or linguistic interpreters. So that's one. The second is we need people who can oversee this, right? You need to have a position of someone who oversees the translate that this is a compliance issue, right? In the same way that we have an IEP teacher that oversees other compliance issues within the school. 
those are my like you know two things i don't think it should fall on the school i think that we it needs to be something that's developed within a policy framework absolutely and having been one of the people who was always called in to do the translations of ieps i totally agree with you that we need people who are well trained and know what they're doing and that they understand the the language yeah. not just the language of the home but the language of the iep exactly so and that, that was... that's another and that that's another major issue right that it's not just about you know there there are different spanishes right there it's the spanishes it's the englishes so these assumptions that we're just going to automate this and get this done quickly it's i think we're really denying the impact on human rights that we are denying of learners and families absolutely and we have a, another question which i think is a really great question because it does apply to many many of our parents is what advice do you have in talking with families who might feel ashamed or embarrassed of a label because culturally it's not accepted in every culture to say that a child has a disability some uh, they confuse meaning so how do we talk to the parents about that I think we need to introduce parents to other ways of thinking about disability. I think talking to parents about the fact that the social model also exists, right? Talking to parents about how disability has existed in the world over time, right? That this doesn't make a person, again, it doesn't make the person broken, it doesn't make them problematic. What we need to think about is that these disability categories and labels were created with the intent to provide support. And they do still provide support, but primarily for white middle income monolingual families, right? Because they know how to navigate those systems and they know how to advocate for their children and there's different trust relationships. So I think it's about how we understand, right? How we're collaborating with parents and how we're presenting the disability classification and what will result of that classification right if you go to a parent and you say this kid has a label now and we're going to move them from their school that's going to be jarring right and many of these families have had very jarring experiences with their child being classified right that's also tied with feelings of them feeling like they don't know their kid necessarily, right? Or that they're not competent enough to support their kid because they weren't competent enough to identify a problem. So it's a lot more complicated than just, you know, this is good, right? We need to be able to understand how parents are engaging with, with these labels and how these systems ultimately Im impact students' um, experiences. Okay, and I've got tons of questions, but uh Trey, are we out of time? You can take one more, you take one more question. Okay, great, provide, because I have a question that connects to what Maria was just talking about. One of your colleagues asked you to clarify a premise you talked about earlier uh, when you started. When does this construct, the way you're thinking about this, say that parents are not having disability-related issues at home? Uh, that it's only in school. No, I don't think that's what you were saying. No, that's not what I'm saying. What I'm saying is that the ways in which they understand the disability impacting their child are different, right? So the, so if you, let's say, for example, you tell a parent that their child has dyslexia, right? And this is a parent who may or may not be literate in their home language, right? But is definitely not literate in English. If you're telling them that their child has dyslexia in English, that's not something that necessarily impacts the family at home, right? But if that child is able to read in Spanish because, you know, it's a more, um, it's an easier, more phonetic language, right? Or like there's simpler cues, that may, influence the parent to believe that it is not an issue at home the ways that it is at school, right? We need to understand that we behave differently and act differently in different spaces. This is also true of children, right? How I feel and communicate anger at my employment, right? Versus how I communicate anger at my home are gonna be different, right? And so we have to keep in mind that the version of the child that a parent is seeing is not necessarily the same version that we are encountering at schools or the ones that we are diagnosing. Absolutely. The last thing I want to say is that 
any of my, um, if you go to my website, which is my name, mariachepeno.com, you have free access to any article that I've published. Um, you just hover over the name. And so that includes the Trudy L article. And I have another article on remote supports for uh, multilingual families there. Um, that's also uh, focused on teachers. Um, and Alfredo, and yeah. last. Just quickly, I want to mention that uh, the Center for Applied Linguistics also has publications on uh, students, uh, dual language learners with disabilities, in case we, uh, anybody would like to go check the website. We have titles there. Yep, and we also have an institute uh, that functions with uh, the MTSS and talks about many issues that we've discussed here today. So any last words as we are going to shut down in a couple of minutes? Just well, thank you so much for holding space for me, my work, but particularly for these students and these families. Absolutely. Okay, so Trey. Excellent. We're right on time. Thank you. I'm just watching the background. This is such an amazing discussion. I really appreciate your time, Maria. Alfredo, as always, it's great to see you and Mari Bell hosting once again this wonderful topic for us. I will remind everybody that we did post a um, a survey in the chat. If you don't mind telling us how we did, what we, what we can talk about next time, I'll put that back in there again. You'll be receiving an email in just about half an hour with the recording of this webinar as well as that survey and some of the resources that we discussed through uh, today's webinar. And um, we we hope that you share this with your, your, your right? colleagues. Say again? Trey, we're going to be posting uh, on our resources also? That's right. In the email that, that you'll get as a follow-up, you'll get uh, this recording, a survey of how we did, as well as some of the resources we mentioned today. Great. Including that MTSS uh, Institute that you mentioned. All right. Again, thanks, thanks Thank for all. the audience for showing up today and being here for us. Thank you Thank so much. Thank you. We'll talk to you soon. Bye. Bye-bye.